delegates, friends, Susan, David, it's a great treat to be with you again. To be with my own union, to be with my international is a rare pleasure these days, so thank you very much. <laughs> David, Susan, congratulations on your election and your strong leadership. Fred, can I, I can't see you, but can I belatedly acknowledge your leadership through the formative years of the uh, Grow and the growth of the EI to the respected global influence it, it holds today. Colleagues, we find ourselves in an age of anger where social despair is being fueled by inequality and the failure to share prosperity despite the remarkable increase in global wealth. You know this yourselves when you consider the slump in teacher wages. Low wages and insecure work can no longer be accepted. We see a world devastated by a failed economic model driven by corporate greed. Your own struggle against the rising tide of private takeover of public education is testimony to this. And I congratulate all of you on the global response and in particular the tireless leadership Evangelo Graviolatis and David Edwards. We see political populism with the rights of extreme rights spreading racism and xenophobia through fear. We see the increasing conflict with another arms race, including the purchasing of mid-range nuclear weapons even in Europe and the very genuine threat to the NPT treaty. And we see the denial of climate science and the political bullying of those that tell the truth about the urgency of fighting for the planet, fighting for the very survival of human beings. The extinction crisis is happening now and we have just over a decade to turn it around and we see the threat of another economic crisis and very, very real threats to democracy itself. And unions are on the front lines because we share a set of values around the world. We stand for hope, not hatred, rights, not oppression, democracy, not dictatorship, solidarity, not division, freedom from fascism, trust, not despair, fairness and not inequality, and courage and not fear. We stand for the 99%, not the 1%, and we stand for dignity, not exploitation. And we are, you are, prepared to stand up every time when we see these values threatened. The solidarity between the Global Union Federations, the ITUC and the CHUAC is critical in this regard. I know Stephen Cotton was here earlier this week and I also know that Pierre Abad would like to have been here because he sees the CHUAC-EI partnership with the OECD as influential regarding education policy. So I pass on his regards. And I can't thank you enough for your response to our global campaigns. The demand to free Lula. Let's see if you remember. Lula Libre. Lula Libre. One more time. Lula Libre. Lula Libre. This is our brother, a political prisoner for no other reason than he was leading his people to social justice. I also know that your solidarity for union members jailed everywhere is critical. And in turn, we stand with you to free teacher activists in Djibouti, Iran, and many other places. The ITUC's mandate, the global union's mandate, is to build workers' power to change the rules. And our Congress just last December determined that our core business would span four pillars peace and democracy. I never thought we'd have to put those back on our agenda again. Regulating economic power, 
global shifts and just transitions, which of course include climate, technology and the massive historic displacement of refugees and equality. And building on these elements, which are our core business, we have three frontline campaigns. One is democracies for people. People need hope. That's the only ingredient that will restore trust in democracies. So our democracies must mean more than the quest for, for income, for GDP, for global wealth. People need to know that their governments are taking responsibility for and reporting on living standards. And that means wages through unions and social protection. A minimum living wage and the strengthening of collective bargaining are fundamental. It means quality public services with care, education, health, including new investment in the care economy across those areas. And it means strengthening the human and labour rights of people and engaging them beyond the ballot box. New Zealand is leading the way with its wellbeing budget, including education. And we've styled our own indicators on this and will take governments to task globally, the IFIs, the Bretton Woods institutions, but we will support you taking governments to account everywhere. Our campaigns in India around the Modi government the support for Argentina around ending the rule, the oppressive rule of the Macri government. We need your help around these and many more areas. And we need, comrades, a new social contract. The new social contract is the industrial agenda that complements healthy democracies, with up to 60% now of the world's workers in informal work including the new platform businesses, which are even eating into educational provision. This requires the implementation of a labour protection floor. And we just negotiated this in the centenary declaration of the ILO. All workers, all workers, regardless of the employment arrangements, must have the guarantees of fundamental rights, of occupational health and safety, of an evidence-based or adequate minim minimum wage on which they and their families can live with dignity and maximum hours of, uh, of work. For teachers, the debate I just heard on professional standards is central to this. If you don't protect the profession, who will? So I congratulate you on your commitment. Beyond that, a new social contract must mean that broader rights and the employment relationship are respected as we fight to formalise work. Collective bargaining must be strengthened. Quality public education and lifelong for learning for all guarantees that further education and skills, as well as uh, the formative years, give workers some control over their lives, including their working lives. And of course, social protection must be universal. We want to see corporate greed controlled with mandated due diligence in every country, the accountability to drive business operations only on the basis of respect for fundamental rights and for collective bargaining. We want to actually see modern slavery eliminated, women's equality realised, child labour eradicated and social dialogue to ensure just transition measures but it must be social dialogue that meets the test of bargaining. We actually want to see the just transitions that include skills for climate, technology, and the equal treatment for displaced workers. The global disruption of digitalization and emerging business models, denying employment responsibilities, requires new standards, including in your profession. The monopoly power of the global technology companies cannot be underestimated. We need to use competition policy, demand that governments use competition policy, that the Bretton Woods Institution use it to break them up. We need a global body to regulate data, the ownership and the value of data. This is important to the knowledge base of our profession, of your profession. And indeed, it's vital to protect workers' privacy. 
we need to accept and fight for the reality that technology doesn't determine the future, humans do. We must commit to a human-centred century where technology serves societies and their economies and not the alternative. And we require reform of multilateralism. The preamble of the ILO's constitution, 100 years old this year, states that the failure of any nation to adopt humane conditions of labour is an obstacle in the way of other nations that desire to improve the conditions in their own countries. In other words, ensuring decent work is central. Labour is not a commodity and labour standards cannot be mitigated or denied by the market. And of course, our third front line is just transition to the pathway for climate ambition. We have just over 10 years to stabilise the planet. We face hothouse earth already. We face an extinction crisis. Without urgent action, this is what awaits us. Despite the climate sceptics and the low ambition of too many governments, the science is in. 2018 is remembered as the year that climate warming hit the Northern Hemisphere. And the same life-threatening heat continues this year in 2019. While workers and their families in Africa, the Americas, Asia have been suffering from high temperatures, droughts, fires, floods and changing seasons for many years, the last two years it's been brought home to Europeans. Indeed, this week it could be hotter in London and in Belgium than it is right here in Bangkok. So scientists are again raising the alarm. There's a domino cascade of melting ice, warming seas, shifting currents and dying forests. And indeed, we've reached the tipping point for many of these nature, uh, natural uh, states. The scientists also tell us that it's not too late, that it's not too late, and that measures to end greenhouse gas emissions rapidly are available but need to be implemented. We also have to start to take adaptation measures much more seriously. Every part of our economy must shift. Steve Cotton is doing a fantastic job in transport. We're seeing others do great jobs in, in industry, but we need every area to shift. And we have to uh, make sure that whether it's construction, transport services, we have the solidarity of the union movement to actually guarantee just transition so no one is left behind. You know the reality. It's a term we coined in Australia and we've taken it all around the world. There are no jobs on a dead planet. It's that simple. So we have to fight to maintain full employment, to build jobs on a living planet and to ensure just transition. Without just transition, we don't have hope and governments won't be supported to reach the high ambition that we need. But the world needs you more than ever. We don't just need your educative abilities, although that's critical. We need to have you stand with those courageous students, with their parents, the mothers for the future. We need to know that you will be with us mobilising on the 20th of September or during that week as the UN convenes a climate summit. Because our governments can't escape this responsibility, but neither can we. And when we take on the Climate Proof Our Workplace um, Day next year, I'd like to know every teacher's uh, workplace is in discussions about how to climate proof the future, your jobs, your workplaces, your communities. But you know, with the concentration of greed, the lack of responsibility of governments, it's not hard to see that when you have theft of tax dollars, you have uh, a denial of, of distribution of wealth, that indeed people are actually losing trust in democracy itself. Indeed, can I tell you, just a month or so ago, we saw explicit directions enter the negotiations around the G7 and a tripartite agreement 
explicit discussion directions from the White House that said it will not refer to social justice. It will not refer to social justice. It's atrocious. And I must say, I wish it was my words, but it was the German Labor Minister who said, so we have red lines too. You won't talk about social justice today. What's tomorrow? Freedom? Then what next? We fought world wars for this. And indeed, that was the birth of the, uh, of the ILO coming out of World War I. So if ever there was a time for not just a new social contract, but for democratic reform and for laying the foundations for peace, it is now. It is now. And it can be done. Imagine that context of 1919 with the despair of the social and economic tragedy inflicted by World War I. How visionary were our predecessors to rise beyond their national or sectional interests and to secure a new global architecture, the ILO, with the mandate to establish a social floor of rights with the dignity of, the, of work as the recipe for peace. The commitment to work together to ensure the democratic rights and freedoms that would underpin the future and to work for social justice was again reinforced in the Declaration of Philadelphia in 1944, another great period of social and economic upheaval with the Great Depression in the Western world and, of course, uh, World War II. But there was indeed the establishment that Labor was not a commodity, that a floor of rights and a wage on which you could live with dignity must be fundamental guarantees. Those leaders recognised there was no peace or democracy without social justice. We can only pay tribute to these leaders who represented governments, workers and employers and their commitment to what was to become the social contract which at least for the Western world guaranteed decades of progress where children would be better off than their parents. They denied, of course, those years, that development to much of the developing world, and we need to put that right in the 21st century. But the challenge of this century lies with us. The SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement offer a pathway for, a, for not just zero poverty, and zero carbon, but indeed a socially just and sustainable world overall. But it will take all of us. Trade unions are again on the front lines and your strength provides hope and optimism for the struggles ahead. It has always been education, always. Think of the great periods of bleak or darkness and indeed uh, the enlightenment that came out of education to chart a future. As David said in, in his blog, we know why education is a target. Educated citizens are the worst nightmare of totalitarian ambition. The tolerance of race, gender, religious and other differences is fundamental to quality education, but an anathema to the organising principles of hate politics. We are so privileged to have a family of global trade unionists, a family of every colour, race, creed, in every country. That's our strength. That's our strength and it's our love of humanity. I thank you for your professionalism, but equally I thank you and I call on you to continue to develop your activism. We're on the front lines, if not us, Solidarity and congratulations on the work you do every day for the humanity of the planet. Solidarity. <laughs>